mute yourself. Uh, we're going to start our program and I'll Good morning, everyone. Um, it is my pleasure to introduce Reverend Kenneth Steigler, who is the elder pastor at All Nations Church. Can you... So Reverend Ken is a graduate of Milford Academy, Ohio Wesleyan University, and Boston University School of Theology. During his tenure as a minister, he has worked with Martin Luther King Jr., Ralph Abernathy, Jesse Jackson, and you can see a host of other important civil rights um, people. In his ministry, Reverend Ken has served across the world, United States, Israel, China, Malaysia, Singapore, South Korea, France, and Germany. He has either directed or worked with drug treatment, social psychiatric, and counseling programs. From 2014 to 2018, he was a tour host for 30 trips to the Holy Land. Reverend Ken is an active Rotarian with the Wake Forest Rotary Club. And he, as I said before, he serves as the elder pastor at All Nations Church in Raleigh, North Carolina. Please give a warm welcome to Reverend Ken, who will be speaking to us today about back in the day with Martin Luther King Jr. Welcome Reverend Ken, and we look forward to your presentation. Thank you. It's, it's a great honor to be here with you all today. I, I thought I'd show you my first slide. It's the picture in Time Magazine. <laughs> I'm not very techie. Uh, this is my first slide of the March 19th, 1965, uh, honoring Dr. Martin Luther King. And I'll quote from in here just a little teeny bit, but I thought I'd, at least I show you what the program is about, Dr. Martin Luther King. And Dr. King was a Baptist pastor. And there's two prayers I'd like to just read to you. He's got an outstanding book. It's called Thou Dear God, Prayers That Open Hearts and Spirits. It's outstanding. It's a great book of prayers. There's two prayers I'd like to share as we start today. As you know, he's a Baptist pastor. And so uh, the prayer will mention Jesus Christ as because he is a Baptist pastor. Um, and here's the prayer. We don't have, don't have to pray it. I just thought I'd read it to you. May we pray eternal God, our Father, help us to love thee with all our hearts, souls, and minds, and our neighbors as ourselves. Help us to realize that we have a moral responsibility to be good and conscientious, but also to be intelligent. And grant that we will always reach out for that which is high, realizing that we are made for stars, for the stars, created for everlasting, born for eternity. In the name and the spirit of Jesus Christ, we pray. The other prayer was when Dr. King faced the 40 calls a day. Remember, you probably all know this. He, he had about 40 calls a day, threatening his life, threatening to kill him and burn, blow him up. And uh, in his life, he, before his murder, it was 10 years before that, there was also a, an attempt to, to kill him. But this is a time when he had to, he, the house was bombed and boy, oh boy, it was a very difficult time for him. And this is his prayer. It, it's very, very significant prayer. Lord, I am here taking a stand for what I believe is right, but now I am afraid. The people are looking to me for leadership, and if I stand before them without strength and courage, they too will falter. I am at the end of my powers. I have nothing left. I've come to the point where I can't face it alone. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. So I thought I'd frame our talk a little bit today just about Dr. King with just a few facts. And then I'm going to go into my life just a little teeny bit. Why did I, why was I so in, embracing Dr. King? Here are a few facts that I, I wasn't aware of that you probably know, but I'm just going to share quickly. Martin Luther King skipped two grades in high school, ninth and 11th grade, skipped them, <laughs> went to college at the age of 14, 15, 
and at 19 received his Bachelor of, uh, of Sociology degree, Bachelor of Arts. His honeymoon was spent in a funeral home, not because anybody died, because that was the only place that he could spend with Coretta. Uh, they had very little money, so they had a honeymoon um, in the funeral home. <laughs> his house was bombed and if, after the, doing the Montgomery boycott, which lasted 385 days. His autopsy, uh, when he was killed, his autopsy uh, showed that he was 39, and the doctor noted that his heart was the heart of a 60-year-old man because of the stress and the strain of being in the movement and facing death repeatedly. There were 700 streets in the United States named after Martin Luther King Jr. His dream, I have his speech, I have a dream, was not his first speech at Lincoln Memorial. He has narrowly escaped the assassin's attempt uh, one time. His mother was, I forgot this, his mother was killed by a single bullet in 1974. I don't know if you remember that, but I forgot that, 1974. And George Washington and Abraham Lincoln are the only other Americans to have their birthdays observed as a national holiday. Martin Luther King was a great inspiration for this nation uh, because of his integrity and his steadfastness and his faith. Just a couple of quotes to kind of frame this a little bit, a couple of quotes. Uh, Injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. These are some of the ones I've heard, I'm sure you've heard too. A riot is the language of the unheard. Uh, that speaks directly to what we're seeing and observing today. The riot, rioting is the language of the unheard. Darkness does not drive out darkness. Only light can do that. Hate cannot drive out hate. Only love can do that. I have decided, another quote, I have decided to stick with love. Hate is too great a burden to bear. We must learn to live together as brothers or perish together as fools. The ultimate measure of a man or a woman is not where he or she stands in the moment of comfort and convenience, but where he or she stands at the times of challenge and controversy. I, I inserted she in there because he would want that for today, I'm sure. But where, where he or she stands at a times of challenge and controversy, seems like he's writing about today. No man, let no man pull you so low as to hate him. No one really knows why they are alive until they know what they are willing to die for and never succumb to the temptation of bitterness. Just a few of the quotes that you probably know, but I thought I'd share that to, to kind of frame our talk today, kind of frame how I got involved with, with Dr. King. And so I'd like to begin just quickly sharing a little bit of my history. As when I was born, I was born in an elevator in Mount Vernon, New York. And the reason I share that is as I was researching and doing a lot of research for this little presentation today, I, oh, I said, oh, there's a, a church in Mount Vernon called the Grace Baptist Mission. And the Grace Baptist Mission was, I'm quoting, uh, where, is where in 1888, five Negro Baptist women with great faith and courage founded Grace Baptist Mission. 132 years later, that is just this year, 132 years later, their names were discovered. Who were these black ladies, Negro ladies? Emily Walker, Matilda Brooks, Helen Claiborne, Sarah Bennett, and Elizabeth Benson. And I thought just as I was beginning this, that I, I wanted to say I was born in Mount Vernon, but you know, the most important thing happening in Mount Vernon, these ladies were identified. And here's a quote from the article by Rachel Pilgrim. Black women have always had to traverse the tough terrain of racism and sexism. And I thought that would help us to kind of get back 132 years and understand why they were never named. And I read in many other materials, you may have read too, that a lot of the women were just numbers. They, they, they were not even named. They were considered property just numbers and they never were named. So I wanted to name them today that have this in the recording. Uh, when I was between one to three years old in Pelham, New York, uh, having survived the elevator of earth, <laughs> uh, my mom and dad moved to a, an apartment building and the first floor and the fourth floor was mom and Lou Gehrig. 
And there was a dumb waiter, and you could, you know, hop into dumb waiter and go up and, you know, you're not supposed to do that, but my uncle did that. And they were on the top floor and they bumped into mom and Lou Garrick. And here's the funny thing mom Garrick and my mother, Mrs. Steigler, were considered German Jews. No one in the building would talk to them. They couldn't speak to anybody around them. Nobody would talk because they were German Jews. They thought Mrs. Garrick was a Lutheran. My mom and dad were Methodists, but they were considered German Jews. And my, my mom and Mrs. Garrick went to the stores and everywhere and they had to write little notes on pieces of paper. I'd like a loaf of bread, please. Nobody would talk to them. I, I'd like a pound of hamburger, please. Uh, uh, please give me my clothes. They, this is what they had to do in order to survive in Pelham, Connecticut, Pelham, New York. Quick jump from there to Milford, Connecticut. The family moved from there. My mom and dad went up and down the entire coast, all the way up to New England, to find a place where Jews were accepted. They, when they talked to the real estate people, they all said, no room for, we don't have any room for Jews, I'm sorry. Well, they moved all the way up to Milford, Connecticut. And my father said, I did, wasn't there, I was only two years old, but my father said to the real estate man, we, we have a synagogue here and we welcome you. And my, my father said, well, if there's a synagogue here and you welcome us, we are welcome to come here. I wanna buy a house here. And so my mom and dad made that decision that we were not gonna live in a place where, where Jews were not accepted. And we lived in Milford, Connecticut for a number of years. Uh, then in Milford, Connecticut, my mom and dad were very busy. My dad was a PGA golfer and started a business in, in Stratford, Connecticut called Monument Motors. And my mother was very involved in Red Cross. And so the family got Mamie Coleman, Mrs. Mamie Coleman, an Afro-American lady, beautiful black lady. And, and I still can picture uh, the time with the children, uh, their, her, her children, our children. We played together, we ate together, we celebrated Christmas together, we celebrated meals together. And it was, we went over to their house a lot and their house was right near the railroad track. And when the train went by, it shook the whole house. I can still remember the house shaking with the there. And so I, I was brought up in this way. And then a, a little bit later, uh, when my mom couldn't stand me around the house because I was such a naughty boy all the time, uh, I worked with my dad at the used car lot. I, I was I count, counted the tires and I cleaned the batteries. I did all kinds of silly little things. My mom and dad, you know, oh boy, my dad was so busy, but he wanted me on the used car lot on Saturday to, to do the work on the used car lot. So I would stay busy because I was an ADHD kid. They didn't know what to call it then. They just said a busy little kid. So I, I, that's what I did. But on the lot, my father made it very clear. Uh, treat every person as if they were the most important person. Look every person in the eye. Relate to every person face to face. Each person is to receive love no matter where they come from. Look attentive. People will trust you if you look attentive. Uh, take a deep interest in what they're saying. Build a network with them. The lot is always was lot was always multiracial, multinational, and the workers came to our home and ate meals with us. The Afro Americans and or black people and the Italian people and the Polish people and all the workers they came and we had this we had dinner with them and it was just normal for us. It was just a normal thing uh, to be interracial. It was a normal thing to have people of multi multilingual. It was just normal. When I went to Milford Academy, which was around the corner, because the school in Milford, Connecticut was the second lowest school rated in the, in the state of Connecticut. It was terrible. And I mean, really terrible. I could tell you a story, but I won't. Uh, it was really terrible. I had to carry a switchblade in the sixth and seventh grade. I carried a switchblade because if, if a guy didn't have a switchblade, you were nothing. You were absolutely nobody. I never in the world was ever think of using a switchblade, but I carried it. Showed it. Oh, look, I got a switchblade. Everybody in sixth and seventh grade, they were carrying switchblades. So my mother and father said, that's not the school for you. We went to, I went to the prep school. My father said, you have to work five jobs in order to help pay for the way. So I had to do all kinds of stuff. And I did, it was 80% Jewish. That was great. We had a lot of discussions in, this, in the study hall and we had a lot of interaction. That was just, it was great. In 1957, I studied to become a United Methodist pastor and I took the course. I studied all that I needed to and became a licensed United Methodist pastor. So I've been preaching since 16 and now I'm 79 I'm still trying to do my best and you can ask Pastor Mark I, I, I try to do my best I try to do my best when I went to college at Ohio Wesleyan University I was a a legacy to uh, Beta Theta Pi uh, you know just one of those big fraternities and I was a legacy well I walked in and saw the nude pictures of women and I saw the beer kegs and it, it oh the atmosphere was just terrible so I left my legacy 
and I'm going to cross downtown over to the railroad track almost with a little fraternity called Beta Sigma Tau. And it was this international house, uh, uh, interreligious house. It was just a, a house that was just, just my cup of tea. <laughs> and I joined that house and that fraternity and learned a great deal living together with, with my brothers and my sister, my brothers. Uh, we didn't have any sisters there. But, and then here's the thing that I learned in, in college. All the freshmen black and all the freshmen black women and men had to live in the furnace room of the dorms. They, they weren't allowed in the dorm, they were allowed in the furnace room. They had little cubbies in the furnace rooms of the, of the this is 1961. I mean, this is awful. That, so our fraternity worked with uh, the, uh, the legal counsel and, and we worked with a we worked with a chaplain and we worked and worked and for four years. And after four years, they finally agreed with enough pressure and enough financial pressure that the blacks had to come into the dorm as all registered real people. And we thought that was a great victory. It seems like a little teeny thing now, but it was a great victory to take people out of the, out of the furnace room and bring them up into the, uh, into the full, full dorm. The other interesting thing about the fraternity, when dis visiting dignitaries came, they, were, they didn't know where to send them. If they were Afro-American or if they were Spanish, they didn't know where to send them. But the, our fraternity was a place where they were all sent. We had the grandest time speaking with people from all over the world because we were at the fraternity that was open and we were relating. And, and in this, my junior year at college, uh, I was studying two, two majors, uh, pastoral, counseling, pastoral counseling and uh, studying scriptures and all, all that kind of stuff and also sociology. So these two majors came together at, at Ohio Wesleyan and the Dr. Butler Jones was our, he, he was our director and uh, the head of the department wanted to have with the pastoral counseling center wanted to have a, a tour a, and they called it a study tour and we had these great big long uh, kind of cigar buses like or not buses there they're like chauffeur chauffeur kind of driven vans I, I think we had eight in each van each each car it looked really nice we had all white sitting on the outside all blacks sitting on the inside because dr butler said about the jones said we don't want to be stoned before we get there. Uh, going to, into Mississippi and all around Alabama, and we didn't want to be stoned. So it, we were called, the, our label, we didn't do it, but our label was called the reverse Oreos <laughs> because we were white and black like that. And, and we were in Albany and we went to go to Birmingham and we thought this would be a good place to see. And we heard about what was going on and the, all kinds of very difficult things in Birmingham. Uh, and we went to Birmingham we, Dr. Jones called and Bull Connor said, if you come in, you'll go out in coffins. Oh, so Dr. Jones didn't think that was a good idea. So when we got down to Birmingham, we stopped at the welcome sign, big, huge welcome sign, welcome to Birmingham. And there were the police. So we stopped the vehicle, we got out, took pictures. I, I, I didn't keep any of these pictures then, we took pictures. <laughs> And then we went over to Tuskegee, to the Tuskegee Airmen, and had a wonderful time with the Tuskegee Airmen. They were fantastic. We got to meet about nine of the Tuskegee Airmen that were there. Uh, it was a great experience. I mean, I just, it, I, my memories there, uh, just loving their presence and their, their stories and everything. Then one of the things that happened when we were going down, we, we stopped in Atlanta on the way going down. And in Atlanta, that, that is the place where we got to meet Reverend King, Dr. King. And in meeting Dr. King, people said, well, did you take pictures? No, I never thought of taking pictures. I, I was so enthralled with the, the event that I never took any pictures. And we got trained that night. We were there for that uh, night. And at 10 o'clock, Dr. King came with Ralph Abernathy and Jesse Jackson. And we got the fellowship with them. And then uh, I'll share a little bit about what Dr. King taught because I, I, I pulled it up. Uh, anyway, uh, Dr. King just, it, it, it was amazing. He was so dynamic. It was just, it was unbelievable. The, the power and the charisma in his person was unbelievable. I, I, I sat there just drinking in everything that he said, every word that he said. And the most impressive thing up to me at the end of two hours of, of some training about how to do uh, covering people and how to do sit-ins and that kind of stuff, uh, they gave us that training so we could know how to do that. 
And the most impressive thing to me was his prayer. At the end, he prayed not from his head, but he prayed from his heart. Like he was like we were sitting in the throne room of God and he was talking to dad <laughs> and he prayed like we were right there. I had never experienced from all my training, all my theological education was coming up. I, I hadn't had that experience ever. And my heart was just moved, moved to, to listen to his teaching. And some of the things that he taught uh, on that day was about nonviolence. I remember, I remember, and I didn't write notes. So here I'm just copying a little bit of what comes out of his book called I Have a Dream. And it, it, it chronologically describes all of the major things that he, he taught. Uh, and this is a little bit about nonviolence. The nonviolent approach does not immediately change the heart of the oppressor. It first does something to the hearts and souls of those committed to it. It gives them self-respect. It calls to us up resources of strength and courage that they did not know they had. Finally, it reaches the opponent and so stirs his conscience that reconciliation becomes a reality. Wow, wow. Uh, you know, I had never heard anything like that. Uh, though. Uh, myself, I, I, I was trying to be always loving. I tried to follow my father's example and try to look at people in the eye and always be genuine with everybody. But I'd never heard it nonviolent talked about in such a way. Uh, and then he, here's some of the points that he shared, and I, I taking it out of his journal, out of his book. Number one, nonviolence, appeal to conscience. Nonviolence is the method which seeks to implement the just law by appealing to the conscience of the great decent majority who through blindness, fear, pride, irrationality have allowed their consciences to sleep. Appeal to the conscience, commitment. Many Negroes are occupied in the middle-class struggle for status and prestige. They want part of, to be part of the cons, con, conspicuous consumption. And then he, I'm skipping a little. A few Negroes in every community unswervingly committed to the nonviolent way can persuade hundreds of others at least to use nonviolence as a technique and serve as a moral force to awaken the slumbering national conscience. And so this is what you know about Dr. King. That this is what his plan was. This is his strategy. His strategy was that this commitment to nonviolence to wake up the conscience of others and not to do anything violently at all. The key to his whole ministry and his whole civil rights movement was love. And this is one of his center, center points. Love at the center of nonviolence stands as the principle. Love. Now, when you hear the word, I don't know if, what it does to you. When you hear the word, you think, of, oh, smoochy, you know, it, it, it's being loving. He was talking about this next point. He was talking about loving is surrendering your will to another and sustaining them as a brother or a sister, as a good friend for life, willing to lay your life down for them. Now that sounds pretty simple, but when you get on the street, and we'll talk about Selma in just a minute, when you get on the street, boy, whew, you have to focus on, the, on, on, on God's presence in you and you're praying for those who, are, who you're seeing. The next point was reaction. It is very important to see the difference between nonviolent demonstration and riots. Suffering, this is a key. The weight of nonviolence means a willingness to suffer and sacrifice. It may mean going to jail. In such case, fill up the jail houses in the South. It may even mean physical death. But a physical, this is the key, but a physical death is the price that a man must pay to free his children and his white brethren from permanent death of the spirit. Then nothing could be more redemptive. And that's how he lived. He wanted us to know that we were to surrender our life if necessary to help others who were on the other side trans be transformed by the love of, of God. F finally, versus violence, a mass movement of mili militant quality it, that is not the same at, at time committed to nonviolence tends to generate conflict, which indeed breeds anarchy. He, let's see, the other thing I wanted to share with you just real quick, the nonviolent re re resistor is willing to accept violence if necessary, but never to inflict it. 
Uh, the doctrine of love operating through the Gandhian method of nonviolence was one of the most potent, potent weapons available to the Negro in its struggle for freedom. Well, that, to say the least, that was just the real quick, quick summary of some of what Dr. King was teaching us. And I sat there as he was teaching these principles as we were sitting there in Atlanta and just taking it in. It was just, and then the next morning we went out and we did a little sit in. We went in uh, white, black, white, black, white, black, but we walked into the front door of the breakfast. Oh boy, that quieted the place for a real moment. We sat down at the counter and asked for a glass of water. Oh, glass of water. The waitress was there with a big ammonia rag hanging from her side. And then she took her ammonia rag off and she just started swinging her ammonia rag. The, the men in the men in the breakfast were kind of yelling and swearing and giving us a real a lot of language and stuff. And we only wanted to ask for water. And we were taught by Dr. King and by Ralph Abernathy and Jesse Jackson, if we, we're only there to agitate, we're not there to instigate. And there's a difference between agitation and it's instigation. Instigation is we don't care. We're going to be here. We're going to be in your face and we're going to agitation. We're just there to try and say, a, prove a point that white and black could come into the front door. White and black could sit at a counter. White and black could have a cup of water, but we couldn't. So we walked out the front door and, and went, went on the trip and did all these things and uh, all over the place and Bull Connor and that kind of stuff. Uh, and then we came back to Ohio Wesley. Now coming back, we stopped at Atlanta airport and at Atlanta airport, you thought you would think it's really safe, really a safe place. But there was a corridor of state police and, and military personnel giving us where we pulled up with the two vehicles. And we had to stop there and go through this corridor because people there were with chains and, and with clubs and, and with uh, wrenches and things ready to kill us because we were the reverse Oreos. We were on a freedom ride, which we called a student, a, a student trip. A learning trip. Well, rushed back from that into seminary and all kinds of stuff in seminary. And then I was, because I raised my hand one time uh, in a seminary meeting, I said, I'd be happy to be the social concerns chairman for the seminary. You know, I, I figured, I figured dances and ping pong and that kind of thing, it'd be easy, you know? Oh no. <laughs> then there was Bloody Sunday. And I got called into the dean's office. And the dean said, Dr. King is called. He wants you to lead the buses down from the seminary and, and we're going to contact Harvard and Andover Newton, you're going to be the leader. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, so uh, I had worked with CORE, I worked with SLIC and uh, SNCC and uh, I had done a lot of different things that worked with the NAACP at, at college and stuff. So I was already familiar with all, all this, what was going on, but oh, bloody Sunday was just horrific and uh, that I was going to be the leader. Well, anyway, in order to get on the bus, we had to, had, had to hand the Dean our last will and testament. We got on the bus and as we as we went down to get into Selma, uh, when we came into Alabama and Georgia, as we came in, uh, rocks, little pebbles like or rocks were just pounding on the Greyhound bus, which was going about 90 miles an hour. And we got there and we thought, boy, when we get there, boy, it, it's going to be a sad state of affairs when we get there because the people were, were, bitten, were beaten. And I just wanted to show you what happened when we got there. Uh, this is the best thing that I can do. This is my slide. I don't know if you can see it. This is the slide. We got there and got off the bus, the two buses, and we were amazed at the people all standing, uh, singing, praising, worshiping. It was like we, we were dumbfounded. We thought there'd be an, an ambulances and the crutches and all kinds of stuff, but it wasn't. This is what we saw. <laughs> they were singing at the steps of Brown Chapel. They were singing and worship. I mean, we couldn't believe it. Well, we went into the meeting, uh, and here's just a picture of some of the other pastors that were standing around waiting to get in. Uh, we went to come into the church, and, and lo and behold, the whole three rows of the front all got up out of their pews, all came back, and they made it so we could sit there with Dr. You know, Dr. King, which right up in front, we could sit there. Dr. King came up, preached, and at the end of the preaching, he said, we're going we're gonna to have an all-night prayer meeting. We all looked at each other. Well, we, we couldn't do that. That was too much. When Dr. King got finished and everybody else left, I stayed with the, the, the pastor of the Brown Chapel because I was a leader of the group. I felt so, so humbled. I was so humbled. I mean, I can still feel my insides just quivering to think that I was the one chosen to be the leader of these, all these clergy and everybody. It was very humbling, very, very humbling. No other way to say it. 
And so we walked, we walked up and in the front of the, the church, it was where we prayed and we prayed with Dr. King. And but I'm telling you, there it was again, that fire, that warmth, that spirit of God was so powerful when he prayed. Whew. We wanted to stay, but I was about falling asleep and we were so tired. We went back over to the parsonage and typed the, the pastor typed up the letter that I sent to the parish where I was coming from. And we trained, we walked each day, we went to get people vote, could vote, and that's all kind of history of that voting stuff. We couldn't do that. I couldn't stay because I had to remarry my mom and dad. So I had to fly out and get home right before the march. I had to fly out and leave a, a good friend, Bobby McLean, who was the, my, the one in second in command. And he took over and did a great job, went on the march. And then I got home and if I married my mom and dad in Milford, Connecticut, got the car, drove to my home, and all my furniture was out in the yard. And I, uh, I asked why, why was everything here? And the, the response was, we don't want a more nigger for a pastor. Uh, to say the least, I was a little, little taken back. I've been in the used car a lot. I heard a lot of words. I never had heard that in my life. So I called the bishop and the bishop sent the district superintendent. And at eight o'clock that night, they came and they put everything back in, took me out to dinner. And it took two years to recover that. that. But in, in Selma, was a time where I worked the closest with Dr. King because uh, when we got there that night, I, I skipped real quick. Well, when we got there, there we uh, some went into the churches and some went to homes. Well, when people went into the homes, the homes were shot out by the Ku Klux Klan and the rednecks at, and at two o'clock in the morning, they shot out the first floors of the home. I mean, shot out the homes. And a lot of them wanted to leave. And Dr. King, when we asked Dr. King, uh, uh, Bob and I went over and talked to Dr. King, would you please come? And he came right over, had the paper, sell the news. He said, <laughs> he it said, agitated, northern agitators arrive. And he spoke for 45 minutes about agitation is what cleans the dirty laundry. <laughs> and we were there to bring dirty laundry, to bring it clean. Well. That's that's a, a quick summary, just real quick too. Here's just a picture of when I we back for a 50th class reunion as Dr. Kent Millard, a good friend, and myself at front of Brown Chapel. I've had the privilege of leading four tours with uh, Ann Clements, an, an outstanding tour guide. If you ever want to go, if you're not going with us, we're going to have a tour from here this coming year with uh, All Nations Club. Uh, if you want to, you need to go. The, the law, the law, oh, the law memorial, the, the stalactites that have names of 4,000 people who were lynched. You walk into that, it's like going into the Holy Cross Memorial. Uh, it's so moving. So I want to share with you just uh, my privilege and my joy of uh, being able to share some of this stuff with where I was and who I was. Uh, it's how I grew up, and I thought it was normal. It was just normal uh, to be loving everybody. And uh, Mary, that's the best I can do. That was a great job. Thank you so much, Reverend Ken. Um, let's see, Marie, are you going to do the, the questions or should I do the questions? How are we going to do this? I'll start with the first one. Um, could you talk to us about your liturgical collar? About what? About your, your, your collar. Oh, your oh, oh sure. Collar. Yep. That's a good question. Uh, when I came back and lived in uh, the Cape and moved from the Cape to Fairhaven and New Bedford, Massachusetts, um, I was trying to, I do, did a lot of things in that community, was the head of the drug treatment program, as well as being the pastor for two churches and youth pastor for five. <laughs> I, I, I like to keep busy. Anyway, um, <laughs> uh, there was a huge riot in 1970, a huge riot in New Bedford. Uh, the police were at the top of the city and the main street of the city with uh, big barrels filled with rocks. And the there was a fire. Uh, Lester Limo, Luma, Lima was killed and it, it caused a riot, a terrible, terrible riot. They burned a whole top of New Bedford, burned it right to the ground. But it stopped right at the Methodist Church, a big, huge fortress of a church. Well, Bill, another friend of mine, a priest, Bill, I can't remember his last name, Father Bill called me and said, we got to go talk to the mayor. This is ridiculous. Well, okay, I agree, it's ridiculous. Um, now, I had been used to being ridiculous because as the chairman uh, uh, of the drug treatment program, we had, we had mafia sitting out in front of our house and uh, ready to do harm. And I would go out each morning and say, hello, did they want water? Did they want coffee or tea? Or can we help them in any way? And they just, you know, grumbled. 
the police called me and told me repeatedly, those are mafia, those are mafia folks from New York. I said, well, we're going to love them. Uh, so we did. And so that was going on, well, the riot was going on. <laughs> anyway, so I, I worked with Bill and we went to see the mayor. The mayor threw a hissy fit. It was terrible. It was embarrassing to think that was not a two-year-old. Uh, we got out, we cleaned our ears and said, oh, phew. So he said, well, we've, we've got to go into the firing line tonight. And here was this uh, store where the Black Panthers were. They were invited in by the community uh, and the police were over here. So there was two lines. Here's the police and here's the Black Panthers. And there was this no man's burned out land. And over here on this side is the church. So I said to Bill, okay, well, we'll go in tonight. All right, not knowing really, but just knowing that I had to focus and, and what does God want? What does God want me to do? And so as I started praying, I saw a collar. So I prayed for the priest. The second time I prayed, I saw a collar. So I prayed for the priest. The third time I saw a collar, I said, Lord, I'm a little stubborn, I guess. I'm a little thick. I'm German. I take a long time to be persuaded. You persuade me. If I live through the night, I'll wear a collar at, for tonight and I'll wear a collar the rest of my ministry. Well, I, I survived, but they came in at 2.30. I had to turn the lights on in the church, open all the windows and, and I sat in the little chair uh, and you could walk in. I lifted every window. They could walk in right from the road, right into the room. And I sat there until 2.30, 2.30 in the morning, reading the Bible. And in they came, guns, gun belts, grenades. I mean, machine guns. It was like, whew. anyway, I never had that happen before, but I just sat there because I knew I was in Lord Tantz. I was going to go, I was going to go. Finally, there was enough calm that I could speak to the leader and say, we're not going to talk like this, yelling and screaming. I want to talk with you. And he, he came over and I said, I want these, these people, slow them down, calm them down. We're safe. Bill, my the priest is talking to the police and I'm going to talk with you. And we talked about the five things they wanted. They wanted a tutorial program for the kids. They wanted food for the kids. They wanted food for the adults, food pantry. They wanted clothes. And they wanted the clergy of the or of New Bedford and Fairhaven to circle them so they could go to the judge and be, you know, you know sentenced or whatever was going to happen. So I agreed. We, we, uh, we would do all those things. And Bill and I called at four o'clock in the morning. Guess what? We got every priest and pastor in town. We got woken right up and told them we're having a breakfast at 730. Expect you to come. And they wanted to know what you two nuts did. What it was crazy. What did you do? We walked in the firing zone. This is what happened. And, and now this is what the Panthers want. Okay, so we said, well, I said, I've got the keys to the church. It's summertime, and the, all the other pastors are gone. I, uh, so I've got the keys to the church. We can do the food. We can do it. We can do everything, except we've got to get the clergy to come and surround, and we did. The next day, the, the next day after that, Tom Atkins happened to be a friend of mine, a black attorney in Boston, head of the NAACP, good friend because of Boston University School of Theology. We, we had worked together before. So I called Tom and said, Tom, can you come please? He went, spoke with the judge, made a plea deal. The judge agreed. And we had 38 out of 74 or 72, whatever it was. We had 38 that surrounded the Black Panthers. And we walked from the fire, from the fire zone down through the town. And the people were a little upset and very angry and yelling and because it was very tense. And, but we just surrounded them and walked into the, into the courtroom and sat uh, behind them, the judge said, you have two weeks to do the things that you've asked for. And he was, he told me he was very angry, but the, two weeks, they couldn't be there any longer than two weeks. And whew, so when they, when it was over, we surrounded them again and walked back to the safety of the black, uh, the burned out place where they, and where they were staying. Uh, and we started the religious coalition, which is still in operation today. And uh, so that's why I wear a collar, long story short, but that's why I wear a collar because that was, because of my training with Dr. King, I was able to walk into that and have peace. And I've had, as others who know me, I've had knives at my forehead, I've had death threats and all kinds of things. And by the grace of God, uh, really, I mean, seriously, by the grace of God, I have survived. And my wife is an angel. She's a precious saint. Uh, she has, she, one time when we had death threats coming at us in Salem, Massachusetts by big loud speakers at two o'clock in the morning, she said, is that going to continue any longer? Two weeks? It was like, I said, honey, we're just going to keep praying for those folks until they get the idea that we're not moving. We're not going. We don't care. I don't care what happens. We're going to stay and we're going to love them. Well, it stopped. Uh, it stopped anyway. So that's a long story about why I wear a collar, but that's, that's why I wear a collar.
Wow, I had no idea that asking about your uniform would solicit such a response, but what a great story. <laughs> um, and I guess there is protection in claiming your faith. Um, there are um, several questions. One, thanks for the fascinating story. Have you written a book? Or are you thinking about it? Yes, Mike Meyer uh, was a teacher here in, in uh, Wake Forest and got put out of the school system for uh, different reasons and things. And so he's a friend. I t uh, he needed counsel. And so I've been counseling him for years and, and then until he got married and I happened to marry. Anyway, <laughs> a good friend. And he wanted to write a book. And I said, well, would you write my book? So he's been working on it now for, I think uh, we're going on seven, six or seven years. He's been working on it, uh, did a lot of research for Ohio Wesleyan, BU, uh, talked to various people at BU that I gave him names, other pastors that knew me and <clears throat> knew what I did because you, you've just heard a little little skim of some of the things that I've done. And so he's writing that book uh, about my life and work with Dr. King and the kind of ministry that, that put me into. And I was very happy to, to serve in, in those different capacities. So the book is coming out probably in 2021, I guess, <laughs> whenever he finished writing it. <laughs> I'm not in no hurry, no hurry to get it out. He wanted to do more of my life. I worked in Salem, Massachusetts. Did I do deliverance ministry for, for witches and Satanists and things. And that's very, very challenging, uh, death threats a lot. Um, and so he, I said, no, nope, we're not going to talk about anything that I did in Salem. We're only going to talk about my life and work with Dr. King. And I don't want the, uh, our family to be under any more attack than we've already suffered. So, so it's just going to be about Dr. King and my work with Dr. King and some of the things that I learned from working with him. What a remarkable life. Does anyone have any other questions? Okay, Rod. Unmute yourself. There you go. Yeah. Uh, well, Reverend Ken, thank you so much. I, I join everybody in just thanking you for sharing your story. Um, and, and I guess the question that comes to mind is, um, we're obviously in a, in a different age and, uh, in many ways, you know, racism, uh, you know, has sort of gone underground, if you will, in many ways, in terms of it being systemic and what have you. And, mm -hmm. um, and all that is being, you know, agitated appropriately, thank goodness. I, my question is, what do you think Dr. King would say and do now if he were alive? Uh -huh. That's a good question. I just happen to have a little answer. Right. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> in the book that he wrote in 1962, this is what Dr. King said about Black Power and the Black Power movement. Once a helpless child, the Negro was now grown politically, culturally, and economically. Many white men fear retaliation. The Negro must show them that they have nothing to fear for the Negro forgives and is willing to forget the past. The Negro must convince the white man that he seeks justice for both himself and the white man. A mass movement exciting, exercising love and nonviolence and demonstrating power under discipline should convince the white community that, there, that where such a movement to attain strength, its power would be used creatively and not vengefully. A guilt-ridden white minority lives in fear that a Negro should ever attain power. He would act without restraint or pity or revenge the injustices and brutality of the years. Through nonviolence, we avoid the temptation of taking on the psychology of victors. Thanks largely to the noble and invaluable work of the NAACP, we've won great victories in the federal courts. Here's the key. We must act in such a way that our victories will triumph, will, will be triumphs of goodwill in all men, white, Negro. And the, and the, the question of, came up also about white backlash. It is a false assumption that so-called white backlash is caused by the slogan back power. Actually, back power slogan has been exploited by decision makers to justify resistance to change. And we see black power now has been uh, commandeered by three uh, ladies who are socialists and they're really manipulating the whole black power movement right now. And it's very violent, very destructive. And one thing I learned with witchcraft, I would share with you now uh, that witches like control authority and power and there's a lot of witchcraft behind what a, some of the stuff is that is going on. Actually, actually, I can tell you. And control, authority, and power is 
that that's the tension. That's always the tension. If I can see that God is really in control, and God is really the power, God is really the authority, then I, I have a higher perspective than I am the instigator who's going to get my way by killing you, by burning you, by taking away your economy, by blowing out your families, and I'm going to get it. That's the, and I see Dr. King would come at, at, at like the Birmingham, the whole 385 days in Birmingham for the bus boycott. <laughs> I see Dr. King taking that authority. And the other thing I'll share with you is in 19, let's see, 1997, attorney James Roch, Roch, R-O-T-C-H, Roch, wrote the Birmingham Pledge, which many people around the world have signed. And this is the counterbalance to what's going on, the Birmingham Pledge. I believe that every person has worth as an individual. I believe that every person is entitled to dignity and respect, regardless of race or color. I believe that every thought and every act of racial prejudice is harmful. If it is my thought, if it is my thought or act, then it is harmful to me as well as to others. Therefore, from this day forward, I will strive daily to eliminate racial prejudice from my thoughts and actions. I will discourage racial prejudice by others of, at every opportunity. I will treat all people with dignity and respect. I will strive daily to honor this pledge, knowing that the world will be a better, better place because of my efforts. I hope that answers what you were, <laughs> what you were asking. But I would see Dr. King uh, it, it, wanting to embrace those who were burning down and those who were yelling and screaming. And, and I, I see Dr. King wanting a, 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 an agitated love just to go in and, and to pull back, not, not wanting to incite, not wanting to cause any more damage, uh, an, an agitated love. And before we go, because I see our time is going really quickly, let me just show you just real quick. I, my wife allowed me to do this. This is the dining room table I'm going to show you. And I hope you can see it. I put a few things out, uh, some books and some articles, the Rotary Magazine with uh, Xavier Ramey and his great article, a uh, terrific article, what he said and uh, the civil rights legacy for in the, in the, the um, Christianity Today and uh, over here in Charisma Magazine. These are just some of the other the magazines and some of the books that there are available there. I hope you could see some of that. Um, was that was that possible for you to see? C could you see any of that? Oh, you could. OK. Could. All right. Uh, my, I can, my wife excuse said, me, my wife one, said, uh, if you, they put it on speaker view, they can see the whole table. Okay. So uh, I don't know if you want to walk back over. Everybody put them put themselves on speaker view. Okay. And yeah, you could, we can read everything on speaker view. Yes. Is that good? Yes. Thank you. That's amazing. That's Thank just some. That, this that's just a little touch. <laughs> yes. And these are the magazines that came out at that time, as well as Time magazine uh, came out. And uh, this this is, of course, this is Pettus Bridge right there. You see the bridge, and everything looks really calm. But boy, it wasn't going to stay calm for very long. Thank you. <laughs> Reverend Ken, do you know if they're going to have the tours again, or is oh. it still held up by COVID? I don't know if Mark is still on. Mark, are you still on? No. Had to leave early. Oh, okay. But yes, the uh, the All Nations Club is, we're going to work together, work with Ann Clements, and we're going to have a, a tour. Uh, the largest tour I've ever taken has been uh, about 40 people that's about as much as we can do in a, you know a full bus and everything but we are planning to do that and the cost would probably be about 650 dollars and it would be uh, uh three days at least at least three days monday tuesday wednesday uh, leaving on sunday night and getting down and staying overnight and coming back on wednesday or thursday so yes we are planning on that uh, right now it's a little difficult with all the covid stuff uh, so we're, we're not, we can't really do it comfortably until COVID is under control and, and is in, is in re remission. But yes, we are going to do that. And I've had the privilege of leading four tours and working with Ann Clements. Um, I consider it, every time I go, I consider it such an honor, such a privilege. Um, uh, I don't know how else to tell you. It's just to serve, to serve 
the community and to serve and bring the, the teaching of Dr. King has just been just such an honor. Just really, it, it's humbling. Uh, some of my friends who are, uh, you know, worked with Dr. King more than I did, uh, uh, it, it's just been a humbling experience, a very, very humbling experience. I don't say that to be, oh, you know, isn't he a good guy? Uh, it's just very humbling. It's very, very humbling. And to have survived uh, to, to this day, uh, it's just a miracle. It really is a miracle. Well, when we, we were in Salem, just one last thing, we had bullets come through the windows. <laughs> we had knives thrown, thrown in the yard. <laughs> so anyway. You have really uh, lived a remarkable life and with calm and grace that uh, it's just, it's amazing. It what a is. story. Mary, and, would you, or, or Chris? Yes, and it, we appreciate you so much. We have a rotary uh, certificate for you for coming. And uh, maybe we, our group can talk to uh, the, the uh, All Nations um, Club and maybe we can join you in that trip. Mm -hmm. that, that'd be honored. I'd be honored. To, we'd be honored to have you all. Yes. Thank you so much. My Thank privilege you. and honor. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.